Today we're going to talk about algebraic expressions. I'm going to start with an introduction to algebraic expressions. Then Candace will talk to you about simplifying algebraic expressions. And finally, Steve will talk about evaluating algebraic expressions. So here's the day where we start algebra. So I'm going to first start by answering the question, just what is an algebraic expression? And then we'll talk about the vocabulary of algebraic expressions, then the geometry of algebraic expressions, and finally, combining like terms. So let's talk about the question, just what is an algebraic expression? And we're going to start in the context of an application. So suppose Anne wants to supplement her income by printing catchy slogans on water bottles to sell at local races. She purchases the equipment to print the slogan on the bottles for $300. The cost of each water bottle and the ink needed to print the slogan on one bottle is about 25 cents. So we're going to start by creating a table that will show the total cost of printing slogans on a given number of water bottles. So here's our table. And as with our graphs, we see that the table has a caption. And we're told here that this table is giving us the total cost of printing slogans on water bottles. We also have column headings. Our first column is the number of bottles. And I've entered a couple numbers here just to start. And the second column will be the total cost. So let's fill in this table and see what's happening here. So if I print the slogan on no bottles, my total cost will just be the $300 for the equipment. Suppose I just wanted to do all this work to print the slogan on one bottle. What would my total cost be? Well, I still have the equipment cost, and I need to take the $0.25 cents per bottle and multiply it by that one bottle I'm printing with the slogan. So my total cost in this situation is just $300 plus 25 cents, or $300 and 25 cents. If I was going to print just two bottles, my total cost would be the $300 for the equipment. And now I'm going to take the 25 cents per bottle and multiply it by the number of bottles, two. So this part of the cost will be 50 cents. $300 plus 50 cents is $300. And 50 cents. So you can see the pattern here. If I was going to print the slogan on just three bottles, then my total cost would be 300 plus the per bottle cost times the number of bottles, which would be $300.75. So you can certainly see the pattern here. But chances are I'm not going to just print the slogan on a couple of bottles. So suppose I was going to go out and print the slogan on 100 bottles. Say I wanted to sell 100 bottles at a small mountain bike race. Then my total cost would be 300. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take the 25 cents per bottle, multiply it by 100 bottles. 100 times 25 cents is $25. So 300 plus $25 is $325. So you can certainly see a pattern that's emerged here. In fact, I could have used this pattern for my first calculation. If I take 25 cents and multiply it by zero bottles, I still have a total cost of $300. So for all of these computations, we took the cost of the equipment and added in the cost of printing the slogan on a certain number of bottles. So suppose now I just called the number of bottles n just an unspecified number of bottles. Then if I was going to calculate the total of cost, I would take my equipment cost and multiply n by the cost per bottle, which is 0.25.
So this here is our first introduction to an algebraic expression. And all this is is a generalization of the arithmetic we were doing to calculate the total cost. Also notice that I didn't use any symbol for multiplication here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So what I used in this last example, this letter n, is called a variable. And in this example, the variable n represents the number of water bottles to be printed with the slogan. So I just substituted a letter to, to represent any possible number of water bottles that I might want to print with the slogan. So let's formally define a variable. A variable is a symbol, usually a letter, which represents a varying or undetermined quantity. So in our example, the number of water bottles to be printed with the slogan varies from production run to production run. The expression 300 plus 0.25n gives the total cost of printing the slogan on n water bottles. This expression is our first example of an algebraic expression. So to define an algebraic expression, is an algebraic expression is a combination of numbers and variables combined by the four basic operations as well as by powers and roots. The only difference between an algebraic expression and the expressions we've been calculating or computing so far is that now we've introduced letters, variables, to represent varying quantities. Algebraic expressions are like phrases in English. Our algebraic expression, the total cost of printing slogans on n water bottles, that's a phrase. It's not a complete sentence. The total cost of printing the slogan on n water bottles. Later on, we'll see an algebraic equation, which will be more like a sentence in English. Also, algebraic expressions are often just referred to as expressions. That when we're in algebra class and we're talking about expressions, we'll just assume that we're talking about algebraic expressions. So the total cost expression is made up of two parts. Each part is also an expression. So let's look at the first part, 300. What does this expression represent? So the expression 300 represents the cost of the equipment in dollars. I'm going to put the units there so I know that I'm not buying this equipment with euros, for example. So the first part of the expression tells us the equipment cost. And this cost is called a fixed cost. It doesn't change. That equipment costs $300 no matter what. Now the second part, 0.25n, is also an expression. And what did this represent? Well, this represented the cost that was independent of the equipment that only depended on the number of bottles that were being printed. So the expression 0 0.25 times n represents the cost independent of the equipment of printing n bottles. This cost depends on the number of bottles that we're printing with the slogan. This cost is called a variable cost. So each of the expressions 300 and 0.25n is called a term of the total cost expression. So these parts I was just referring to are called terms. 
At this point, you might be thinking that the vocabulary is getting a bit out of control. So let's take a few minutes just to talk about the vocabulary of algebraic expressions. So let's start with term. The terms of an algebraic expression are the parts of the expression that are combined by addition. So we had two parts, 300 plus 0.25n. This algebraic expression has two terms, 300 and 0.25n. Typically, we read math from left to right, so the first term is 300, the second term is 0.25n. Now here's our total cost expression again. The first term in the expression, 300, is called a constant term. The second term in the expression, 0.25n, has two factors, 0.25 and n. The first factor, 0.25, is called the numerical coefficient, or usually just the coefficient, of n. So let's define all these new words that came up in that description. The factors of a term are the parts of a term that are combined by multiplication. So terms are parts of an expression combined by addition. So when we think about terms, we kind of think about addition. Factors are parts of a term that are combined by multiplication. We've actually used that word factor in the same way before. For example, when we talk about 6 having factors 2 and 3. 2 times 3 is 6. A constant factor in a variable term is called a coefficient. So our variable term, which happened to be the variable cost, was 0 0.25 times n. 0.25 is the constant factor, or the coefficient, of this term. Sometimes we say 0.25 is the coefficient of the variable n. A constant term has no variable factors. In our example, the constant term was the first term, 300. There's no variable factors there. This newfangled variable n is nowhere to be found. This is called the constant term. So now let's look at a couple of algebraic expressions and work with this vocabulary. So we're going to look at the expression 3x plus 4. And the first question we're going to ask is, what is the variable in this expression? Well, the only letter floating around in this expression is x. So the variable is x. And at this point, I want to just take a moment to talk about multiplication in algebra. Now, back in the day, we used to write 3 times 4 equals 12. We used something that looked a lot like an x to represent multiplication. So I think you can see why we no longer use that symbol for multiplication. Um, when we write in algebra, we write a constant factor times a variable we typically don't write any symbol for multiplication. So this is just 3 times x. But notice that when we're working with just numbers, we do need some symbol for multiplication. I can't write 3 next to a 4 and think that is multiplication, because that certainly looks like 34. And 34 does not equal 12. So we're still going to use a symbol when we're multiplying two numbers. 3 times 4 is 12. So the only time we are leaving out a symbol for multiplication is when we're multi multiplying a constant by a variable. So going back to our expression, how many terms does this expression have and what are the terms? So remember, terms are the parts of an expression that are combined by addition. So we see we have 3x plus 4. We're combining two things. So the expression has two terms, and I'll just list them, 3x and 4. Which term is the constant term? Well, 4 has no variable factors. That's the second term. 
So the second term, 4, is the constant term. Now in these examples, I'm taking the time to respond to the question using a complete sentence. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this is to practice the vocabulary. It's going to be very important as you continue in algebra that you use this vocabulary correctly, that you understand me, that you understand your own instructor, so that when you hear words being thrown around like expression and terms and coefficients, that you know what's being talked about and so that you can talk to other students about algebra. So as you're doing problems like this in your textbook, you might want to take the time, certainly at the beginning, to write your responses in complete sentences to get used to using the new vocabulary. So now let's look at the first term. What are the factors in the first term? Well, the first term is 3 times x. There are two factors in the first term. And I'll list them, 3 and x. What is the coefficient of the first term? Well, the coefficient is the constant factor, 3. The coefficient of the first term is 3. Let's look at a more complex expression. 4xy plus x over 2 minus 5. What are the variables in the expression? Well, in this expression, we see two letters, x and y. The variables are x and y. How many terms does the expression have, and what are the terms? Well, remember, the terms are the parts of an expression combined by addition. But here, we have some subtraction thrown into the mix. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this expression as using addition. So subtracting 5 is the same thing as adding the opposite of 5. So now I clearly see that I'm adding three things together. There are three terms. The expression has three terms, and I'll list them. The first term is 4xy, the second term is x over 2, and the third term is negative 5. Which term is the constant term? Well, that third term, negative 5, is the constant term. It's the only term that doesn't have an x or a y. What are the factors of the first term? Well, the first term is 4 times x times y. So there are three factors, 4, x, and y. The factors of the first term are 4, x, and y. What are the factors of the second term? Well, when I look at the second term, I see x over 2, or x divided by 2. And factors are the parts of a term that are combined by multiplication. So when I look at the second term, x over 2, the first thing I'm going to do is rewrite this as a multiplication problem. So x divided by 2 is the same thing as x times the reciprocal of 2, 1 half. And if I use the commutative property, I can write this in the more standard form as 1 half times x. And actually, this is the way that terms like this will be written. The numerical coefficient first, followed by the variable. In an algebraic expression, you will not see the variable followed by a constant factor. So now it's very clear what the factors are. The factors of the second term are 1 half 
and x. What is the coefficient of the second term? Well, we really answered that question in the course of doing our last example. The constant factor is one-half. So the coefficient of the second term is one-half. So let's take a couple of minutes to look at the geometry of algebraic expressions. So we're going to look at x, x squared, and x cubed. And we're going to start off with supposing that x is greater than zero. This means that x represents a positive number. This is what's going to allow us to look at these expressions geometrically. So if we do this, we can think of the expression x as a length. So if x is greater than zero, then x lies to the right of zero on the number line. And if I draw a line segment from zero to x, the length of this line segment is x. So algebraically, x can be represented by a length. So now let's consider x squared. We can think of the expression x squared as an area. So what's going to happen here is I'm going to take my length x and I'm going to create a square. Each side of the square is x units long, and if I consider the area of the square, that would be x times x, or x squared. x to the second power we usually refer to as x squared, and now you can see why, that geometrically there's a square and its area is represented by x squared. So now let's look at x cubed. x cubed can be represented by a volume. So if I take a square of area x squared and add a third dimension, I now have a depth, a length, and a width, all of x units long. And when I calculate the volume of this cube, I get x cubed. So the expression x cubed represents a volume. So x is a length, x squared represents an area, and x cubed can be represented by a volume. Three very different types of mathematical objects. So now let's consider the expression 4xy. So let's just look at 4x by itself. We've talked about x. x can be represented by a length. So what we want to do is look at four of these. There's 2x, 3x, 4x. And what we have now is a new length four times our original length. Now let's consider y by itself. Now y can also be represented by a length. Now in this picture, I've made y a little bit longer than x, but it could be shorter. It actually could be the same length, but just for the sake of the picture, I made y a little bit longer. And now look what happens when I multiply 4x times y. I get the area of a rectangle whose length is 4x and whose width is y. So the expression 4xy represents the area of this rectangle. We have 4x, the length, times the width, y. Now there's another way that we could look at this picture. Here's another rectangle. The width of this rectangle is x, the length is y. And I can actually fit four of these rectangles into my original rectangle. Each one of these rectangles has area xy, length times width. So what we have now is four rectangles, each of area xy. And when I multiply the area of each of these rectangles by four, I get the original rectangle I started with. Now what's kind of neat about this example is it allows us to see the associative property of multiplication. By looking at the area of the big rectangle and comparing it to the, the sum of the areas, or four times the area of the small rectangle, we see that these areas are equal 
which is just a way of stating the associative property of multiplication. So now let's simplify 3 times 4y. We're going to stick with this geometry idea for just a little bit longer. 4y, I have 1y represented by one length, and I've just shown you a picture of four of them. And what I need to do is triple this. So what we're looking at here is 3 times 4y. Now I can use the associative property of multiplication to simplify this expression. We know the answer should be 12y. We just saw 12 of those little y's fly across the screen. But if I have 3 times 4y, using the associative property, I can rewrite this as 3 times 4 times y, which is just 12y. So what I've done here is I've used the associative property but I certainly could have gone right from my original expression to the simplification in one step. Let's do that here. I want to simplify negative 5 times 20k. So what I'm going to do is multiply the two numerical factors. Negative 5 times positive 20 is negative 100 times k. So now let's look at this term 4x times 5. What is the coefficient of this term? Well, 4x times 5, this number 4 just jumps out at us. And it's tempting to say the coefficient is 4. But if I use the commutative property and then use the associative property, I see that when I simplify this expression, I end up with a coefficient of 20. So the coefficient is 20. When finding the coefficient of a term, you must consider all the factors of the term, regardless of their given order. So finally, I'm going to talk about combining like terms. The first thing we need to talk about is what is a like term? Well, like terms in algebra have identical variable factors. So let's look at some examples. So first example of like terms, 5x and x. Here the variable factor is x. Both of these terms have a variable factor of x. But 5x and y are not like terms. The variable factor in the first term is x. The variable factor in the second term is y. 3ab and 2ab, these are like terms. x and x squared, these are not like terms. Now both of these terms have factors of x, but in the second, um, the second term, x squared, we have two factors of x. So when we're talking about identical variable factors, we're also interested in the number of times that factor occurs one factor of x, two factors of x. And as you remember, x could be represented by a length, and x squared can be represented by an area. So these are definitely not like terms. 4x squared and x squared, on the other hand, are like terms, whereas xy and x are not like terms. 2m and m. Those are like terms. But m squared and m cubed are not like terms. So let's combine some like terms. We're going to start with a very simple example, 8m minus 3m. So we're just going to draw a picture just to see how easy this is. Here's 1m. Here are 8m. What do we want to do? We want to take away 3 of them. We're left with 5m. So 8m minus 3m equals 5m. Pretty darn easy. And really, the only algebra I did was really arithmetic. I just subtracted 8 minus 3 to get 5, just as if I was doing plain old arithmetic. Let's consider negative 12w plus 5w. Negative 12w plus 5w, the only algebra I'm doing is arithmetic. I need 
to add negative 12 and 5 and just put that as a coefficient of w. So negative 12 plus 5 is negative 7 times w. So negative 12w plus 5w is negative 7w. Combine like terms x cubed plus x squared. Well, hopefully you're thinking, and I can't do it. I mean, remember, x cubed represents a volume, x squared represents an area, and there just isn't any way I can add an area to a volume. So the expression x cubed plus x squared cannot be simplified. We don't have like terms. There's nothing we can combine. Now let's look at a slightly more complex expression. So we have 3a minus 2a plus the difference of 4b and 3b. So here's an a and here's a b. Two different variables, they could represent two very different lengths. We start off with 3a in our first set of parentheses, and we start off with 4b in my second set of parentheses. The order of operations tells me I can simplify the expressions inside the parentheses first. So if I take away 2a from 3a, I'm left with 1a. And if I take away 3b from 4b, I'm left with 1b. So to work out this problem, 3a minus 2a plus 4b minus 3b is simply 1a plus 1b. So now, I want to just write this as a plus b. Typically, when we have a coefficient of 1, we don't write it. 1 is the multiplicative identity. 1 times a is just a. So when you see an algebraic expression that just has an x as a term, or just has an a as a term, we just treat the coefficient as 1. So now let's simplify 92z squared minus z squared. So I have 92z squares, and I'm taking away 1z squared, and I'm left with 91z squared. So I'm going to just digress for a moment and point something out about z's in algebra. I'm using the letter z in algebra. And if I was just writing along and I was writing out my numbers and I was writing out my letters, whoops, see, I made an algebra z. This would be very ambiguous. Without putting the line in the z, my z could look very much like a 2. So when I'm writing algebra, I try my hardest to make my 2's as curly as possible. And I put that line through the z and see what a habit it's become. It's very hard for me not to do that. I put a line through a z to distinguish a z from a 2. So another very simple example, negative 7c plus c. Remember, this is just negative 7c plus 1c, and I'm just going to add negative 7 plus 1 to get negative 6c. Now, I don't have to write this intermediary step. This was just to emphasize that the coefficient on c is 1 in this example. So now, let's simplify 4x minus 5x. Well, 4 minus 5 is negative 1. So I'm left with negative 1 times x. But we know that when we multiply a number by negative 1, we get the opposite of the number. So the result is the opposite of x. And I'm writing this out to say something about the language. When we see this minus x, what we're really talking about and what we should say is the opposite of x. It, the number might not be negative. Some people will say negative x when they see this result. But that is, indicates to some people that this result is negative, and it may not be negative. For example, if x equals negative 3, then the opposite of x is the opposite of negative 3. And the opposite of negative 3 is a positive 
number. So we want to be a little bit careful with our language here when we're talking about the opposite of x. Um, it's different. Negative 2 is fine because negative 2 is a negative number. But when we see the negative sign in front of an x, we don't necessarily have a negative number. So now let's combine like terms in this problem. Well, here we can use the commutative and associative property to simplify the expression. So using the commutative property, I can rewrite this problem so that I have all my n terms and all my constant terms together. So 3n plus 2n, adding those, that's 5n, plus 4 plus 7, that's 11. In this example, I'm not going to rewrite things. I'll just use the commutative and associative property as I'm working the problem. 5k minus 1k is 4k. 9 minus 3 is 6. So this simplifies to 4k plus 6. That finishes this part of the lesson. Now Candace is going to come and talk to you about simplifying algebraic expressions in some more detail.